All right, I have uh, a little problem here. I have a frog on my throat. <laughs> so you have to excuse that. And I got a bird on my head. <laughs> I'm tweeting. <laughs> no, she's actually tweeting. So I'm doing this from the uh, Bronx Zoo. Uh, actually, I'm down in Florida, and I got my Gatorade. I got the uh, alligator. I got the bird. I got the frog. And I got another friend of mine uh, from the animal house, and that's uh, Herb Cohen. Now, uh, Herb is the uh, man who is famous for you can negotiate anything except uh, Joey Reynolds' contract. But uh, he, he is absolutely uh, uh, one of my really best friends. But more than that, he's Larry King's best friend. And I've always been jealous of that. And when I met uh, Herb later on in life, uh, I always was a – I don't think he knew that I was an intern – before we called him that, actually, I was Larry King's love slave down in Miami uh, when he was on the radio. And uh, uh, Larry, Larry and her went to school together in Brooklyn, as I understand it. And they, they stayed friends through the years. But Larry was, was on the air on radio in Miami, on Whammy in Miami, W-A-M-E in Miami. And I was a kid just being uh, myself. And the other guy, I had, I had Larry King in one ear and I had Howard Cosell in the other one. So this accounts for my brain damage, somewhat. Uh, now, uh, Herb did not know that I already had experience with Larry. I don't, I don't even think we ever talked about it, but he lived on the Surfside 6 boat, and he had a lot of gaming going on with the uh, horse racing, and they're all back. Hialeah's open. All right. Anyway, the fact of the matter is that I am uh, having good times with uh, a lot of my wonderful, experienced, brilliant friends, and Herb's one of them. Uh, he's uh, in the uh, in the league of uh, of people who are good thinkers, free thinkers, also fair minded, and also just really a decent ci citizen, and and a smart guy. So you know, smart's not a word I toss around easily. Anyway, uh, with this long intro and putting myself at the forefront here, I want to establish a little credential that uh, uh, Herb is really one of those people that. If I can get it out of him, he can help us with the world problems and uh, to understand them better than they're being presented on the two opposing views. Like CNN is all Democrat and the uh, uh, Fox is all Republican, the foxhole. Uh, you know, that's a propaganda machine. Both of them are. And I, I, so when I want to know something, I call her. But if he doesn't want to share this, he'll dance around it. <laughs> He's good at it. <laughs> Hi, Herb. <laughs> Hello, Joey. That's I, know, I know it's a long intro. I, I just wanted to establish a little beachfront here. I'm sorry for that. That, that is a very unique introduction. <laughs> Actually, I thought you would uh, focus on my age. I come. No. Well, I come from a world where cable was used to tow cars. <laughs> where the net was what hung down from a basketball hoop and I'm so old now that I go back to the time of the Beatles no not uh, John and Paul and Ringo and those guys but the little black bugs where you flipped up the light switch and they dashed out in a room so that's my story you see what it says imagination has no age no yes. age. No, no age. age limit. So we're limitless. Also, because the bird is here, we have no foul moods. <laughs> but that has nothing to do with this. So, well, you know, Herb, Herb and I are friends. So, you know, it's not a news interview where people interview, they interview. Uh, what I, I, like your, I like the way you think, and I like your insights, and I don't think America gets enough of that. You know, I don't think we have that... Uh, that little round table. I'm very happy that we're all together as a country for a change. Now, what, this is my own thing. I think that we have created, uh, because of the pandemic, which is we did not create, I don't think we did, uh, we now have an even playing field. We all have to get along and start over again. Am I correct about that? Yes, if you're asking me. Yeah, I am. I'm asking you. I think uh, it is important for 
people not just to be tolerant, but understand that everyone is unique with unique experiences. Uh, we don't see things as they are. Each of us see things as we are. And whether people realize it or not, they're captives of their particular experience. And especially Americans, what we tend to do is we ascribe our values and beliefs to other people. We say, well, if I were him, this is what I would do. <laughs> and invariably, you're not him. So <laughs> get off track. And that's how I earned a living uh, all these years, by not stereotyping, by listening to people, by asking questions. And suddenly, this guy is a genius, you know? He's <laughs> clairvoyant. All I do is uh, I listen to people. One of my strategies in life is to make people feel superior to me. In many cases, you have to work very hard. But nevertheless, it pays off. People kind of identify with you. They like you. So as a negotiator, I would go to China and be very successful. Uh, I negotiated the strategic arms reduction talk agreement in the Soviet Union, which limited uh, the uh, amount of uh, uh, nu uh, nuclear missiles, uh, long-range ballistic missiles, as opposed to the INF, which dealt with short-range missiles. But I did that. And uh, I was you know, somewhat successful in dealing with people by simply doing what I'm saying to you, just listening to them, asking questions, reading the cues, understanding that meanings are not in words, but in people, and people are unique. So that's my life story. Well, it's, it's part of it. Uh, I think you said something significant the other day we were just chatting, and you said that uh, we've had 12 years, uh, 75 years of, of communism, where we've despised communism or not now liked it, and uh, there's a distinct difference between communism and socialism. And I and he, you said to me in some states, I don't think people understand that difference. Yes, well, I probably was talking about the candidacy of Bernie Sanders, who has a lot of good ideas, and uh, I having lived in the Midwest for 27 years and spent my life traveling all over. I've been to 49 states virtually all the time, working, giving speeches, interacting with people. And I said that Bernie Sanders cannot win uh, the presidency simply because the average American person, the voters, a substantial number of them, do not understand the difference between socialism and communism. And we spent all these years hating the communists. And here was a guy who people in Iowa think this is a commie guy. And so he can't win. You know, <laughs> this, I mean, maybe the best candidate who happens to be gay, you know, a brilliant guy, veteran, good experience, good ideas at this point in time in the United States would have a difficult time becoming president. That's my opinion. You know, and, and this election is very interesting. Uh, uh, I mean, Donald Trump has a good chance because of, uh, you know, Joe Biden and how he handles this problem, you know, of the allegations made against him. Uh, you know, you want to stick around a few more years to see what happens. Well, how, how did this guy who's a celebrity get elected without any experience in government or any of the, how, how do you, why do we elect uh, celebrities, movie stars, well, television stars? What are one, we doing? One thing is we, uh, Donald Trump was on The Apprentice, I believe, for 12 years, that show yeah. went. And they, uh, taped him for hours. Uh, let's say they have uh, 80,000 feet of tape, of which they use 6,000. So therefore, it was edited to make Donald Trump look very good. 
whenever you edit something, take that out. That sounds stupid. That sounds mean. We want to portray Trump in a certain way so that our audience identifies with him, come back, comes back every week. And so what the American people think is Donald Trump is this mythical TV character. And he, he himself, in my opinion, lives in fantasy world, you know. Uh, I mean, he could say something one day and contradict it totally the next day, and it's on tape. And it just goes beyond that. No, there was uh, a there's a special on PBS about Bob Hope, the documentary, and yeah. uh, it it's said on and it's quite good. It's quite good. It's not one of those fundraisers like they do. And in the uh, one of the people said uh, one of his writers who was with him all the time. He said, and, and it was not a slam. He said, Bob wakes up every day try, trying to be Bob Hope. He said, because he's yeah. completely focused on being Bob Hope. He, they created the persona. And Bob Hope is that person, and he has to work towards being that person every day. Because that's the, that's the image that, that you have of someone. And yeah. uh, I think maybe we all have that. But, but the fact of the matter is that we have somebody in office who's really um, controversial and and, and what I don't like is, is what Martin Luther King didn't like. We're separated. We're segregated. I mean, how, how did we get separated like this again? What, why do we keep getting separated? When are we ever going to agree on anything? Or was there, was there time when we all did? I, I even forgot. It's, been so, it's so convoluted now. Yeah. Well, that's the world we live in today. Regarding uh, Bob Hope, uh, he virtually said everything off a of cue card. In fact, I heard Johnny Carson say that uh, the person he never wanted to have as a guest, who he actually had as a guest, was finally, yeah, it took a long time. Didn't ad lib. Yeah, you know, he's looking for the cue card, and uh, you know, and Johnny Carson, you know, had some of his best people who would ad lib, uh, Buddy Hackett. Uh, you know, all of those guys were on his show. Well, I, I had the first we're, we're satellite here. show in 1977. I was the first satellite broadcaster. And the first anniversary show was from Bob's house in Toluca Lake. I had yeah. Bob's writers for one hour. Then I had Bob for the second hour. And he didn't really respond to the questions I was asking. They were very personal. You know, I was asking you intimate things. He, it, I don't believe uh, those people from that era were not intimate. You could name any of those comics. They had a persona, even George Burns, and I, I respect I respect them all, but they, they were not intimate. They were not open with their personal yeah. feelings. They're press releases. And yeah. uh, uh, Bob, Bob didn't hear a lot of what, what I was saying because I found out his hearing aid is not in his ear, but it's in his chest. He used the old-fashioned one. And I'm talking to his head, and he's not hearing me down here. <laughs> so yeah. I got down on my knees and uh, after the break and started begging forgiveness, you know. Uh, but, but that's him. Anyway, I want to talk about you for, for a bit here. You know, uh, uh, you, were, you were working for several presidents, I believe. Is that correct? I was working for one. I'm sorry. What, what? Did, you, what did you just ask me, Joey? I, I said, you, see, you must have that hearing aid down on your chest. I said, you have worked for several presidents. Yes. The, yeah, and, you, call, and, you call it work. Yes, I <laughs> I have uh, uh, advised several presidents, some of whom actually took my advice. You know, I okay. started out uh, uh, early on in the Iran hostage crisis where the people surrounding Carter didn't really know that much about Iran. Uh, they, a lot of them, you know, were brilliant people who were experts, like Brzezinski was an expert, really, in Poland and Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union. And so this thing hit, and they were looking for someone. At the time, I was involved with the FBI, helped set up the FBI's hostage negotiating program. This was uh, a long time ago. And so uh, I get uh, called in, and... Uh, and I found that they didn't have uh, any expertise, you know, and I was able to kind of think like an Iranian. 
Iranians are negotiators. Uh, uh, you know, think of your own experience, Joey, or anyone observing this. Have you ever uh, purchased a Persian rug retail? You know, even if you wanted to, they wouldn't let you. <laughs> it was a bargaining culture. They had 52 hot rugs for sale. Those were hot. <laughs> And we were try they were trying to get as much as they could for their illegally obtained merchandise. And so President Jimmy Carter walks into the rug seller's bazaar and says to them, I need the rugs, the hostages. I want the hostages. They're the centerpiece of my foreign policy. If I don't get them out, I won't campaign against Teddy Kennedy in the primary. Now, so you have a buy-sell situation. The seller has something you want, and you tell them you can't live without it. What's the price going to go, down or up? It's going to go down, uh, up, excuse me, of course. Uh, and therefore, it becomes more difficult for us to get the hostages out. So I advised President Carter. I was famous at one time as a person he should have listened to. And uh, after that, uh, Bill Casey, uh, after I left, Bill Casey talked me into meeting with him. Bill Casey, as you recall, was Reagan's campaign manager. And then he became the, the director of the CIA. Right. I met with him at the Plaza Hotel. And um, I told him, you know, how the hostage situation should be played by the chief executive. And Reagan, President Reagan, uh, listened to me. I wrote a paper for him, a big report, and I met with him when he rented this place in Virginia. And, uh, you know, and I predicted the date and time the hostages would come out if he handled it that way, and it worked out. And so I helped President Reagan, and then thereafter, I was asked my advice when uh, Jimmy Carter, not Jimmy, when uh, Bill Clinton was president. Um, lately, no one has solicited my advice, thank God. Well, how so, about the time in, in Asia? You've spent time with uh, negotiating with the South Koreans, right? Yeah, yes. I spent time in South Korea. In fact, I actually went on that tour that North Korea has, which no one seems to know about. They had this tour where you go overnight and you stay in North Korea, they're desperate for foreign currency. And I found out things that were really interesting, like at Poignang University, they have Americans working over there. People that study, these are Americans who they pay a lot of money, who work uh, in their schools. Uh, their universities and really help them uh, with their technology. By the way, that's the trip that this American guy went on who uh, took a painting or a print off the wall as a souvenir, and they arrested him, locked him up, had yeah. this funny trial in which they put him in prison, and he came back, you know, in a coma, and he died, yeah. uh, you know. Uh, in this country, you know, rather famous thing. I forgot his name. Right. But uh, his family is still grieving his loss and they are still trying to pursue North Korea. So my point is, I've been around, but in my case, I would not confuse movement with progress. Activity should be separated from accomplishment. I've had a lot of failures, Joey. Well, what what is uh, what this flu now? Let's go to this for for a moment. Uh, I I think I told you the other day when we were talking. I think that this North Korean guy is collaborating with the Chinese, and something went crazy with this lab uh, invented uh, uh, virus. I don't know. Do we call it a virus, or is it some sort of a yeah. um, an invention to uh, a chemical that is going to destroy people. I mean, what, what do we call it? I don't, I don't want to call it a virus. A virus is kind of a, sounds like a medical word. This, and I, I think the other, what really happened, nobody wants to talk about because it probably, you'll get killed, I guess. 
What's happening? What, what is, what's the truth? Well, I tend not to believe uh, in conspiracies because once you get people involved, you also, and it's a big secret, you know, for example, if someone had the real truth about who killed President Kennedy, and if they wanted to market that, you know, get on TV, write a book, uh, that's worth $20 million to tell that yeah. story. And so if you have these deep, dark secrets that people, by the way, want to believe in, uh, uh, ultimately they come to light. You know, I grew up at a time when we had a lot of stereotypes, we still do, and people have a need to feel protected, like they have a sense of mastery over their own life. So in my day, Joey, going back a while, like a woman would get raped, and it would be like a, an 80-year-old woman would be in a nightgown in her apartment on the seventh floor in an apartment house in Manhattan. Some guy would climb up the fire escape and rape the woman. And people would ask a question, well, did she pull down the shade? You know, I was stressed. Uh, she was attacked. What neighborhood was she in? See, as if somehow, if you dress appropriately, if your skirt is two inches below the knee instead of two inches above, that you would not be a target. These guys are perverts. And they do this stuff. And, uh, and it has nothing to do with the victim. You know, the victim is someone we ought to feel sorry for. And so, but people need, and that's the same thing with conspiracies. They got to believe in certain things. For example, uh, there's stereotypes about Jewish people. And I was in corporations where I was the only Jewish person. You may not notice, Joey, but I am of the Hebrew persuasion, <laughs> although I do not remember being persuaded. And I see. <laughs> people would, you know, say to me, as really, uh, you know, as a unique person, I was the first Hebrew they ever met. And, uh, you know, we go out to eat and maybe I would order an extra dish. They say, hey, you seem to have a lot of money, you know. And I would say, well, that's because I'm Jewish, you know. See, if I have a money problem, I have this secret phone number. Two six seven thousand. I call up. They send me a check. So <laughs> need no problem. See, if I were Italian, I'd also have a number. If somebody pisses me off, I have this phone number: Italian five nine four hundred, and uh, I get this guy whacked. You know, <laughs> a phone call. and people want to believe in that bull. You know, and it's obviously not true. People are different. People are unique. And if you see them that way, you get much more out of life. Your life's enriched. And furthermore, you don't go down these stupid stereotype paths where you believe that people are whispering. They're whispering about me, you know. They're not whispering about you. They don't care about you. They're just <laughs> trying to get by. Like everybody. Everybody got problems. You see, and in life, one of the best things I learned is we can't control what happens to us. Things happen that are unexpected. This virus, uh, th this coronavirus, who would even think it occurred? What counts in life is not what happens to you, but how you react to what happens. You can't control what's going to happen, but you can control how you react. And that's what you're responsible for. And if you live by that, life tends to be better, it's easier, and it's more enjoyable. Well, unfortunately, in the, in the equation, I agree with you, and I live that way mostly. But there is a political structure here. And it, it, it seems to be riddled with, uh, with uh, illusions. And, and, you know, it's a magic trick. Uh, we don't know. I don't know whether to, to uh, be a Republican or Democrat, a libertarian. Uh, I, you know, I'm a political atheist anyway. But I, I believe that a lot of these things are happening only because we have not taken care of business. We haven't done the right thing on occasion. 
I think the planet, for instance, now that we have a very few automobile cars driving in this last few weeks, the planet's cleaned up a little bit. The water's better and the air is better. I mean, that's a no-brainer. Uh, but then, too, we ruin an industry. So, what do we? Are we? Are we more interested in the economy and and money than we are in living? I mean, I I'd like to live a little longer. How about you? Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, I have a, a wonderful family who are very supportive of me, and uh, and so yes, I would like to live as long as I'm you know healthy, which I I'm lucky that I am. Uh, but I think, you know, if you want to live a good life, you should care about yourself, but care about other people as well. You know, see, what people think is that life is a zero-sum game. You know, we use the analogy of the pie. Like, well, if you get a bigger slice of the pie, I get less. So let's say the pie is 12 slices. Okay. My strategy in life is to get seven slices holding you to five. In some cases, people want 10 and you get two. But in reality, uh, I may, although the pie is something, I may be more interested in the crust than the contents of the pie. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and in life, this thing you're talking about People see it differently, and it is different. And so what you can do is you can expand things so everybody gets more. Because you and I don't want the same thing. You know, people are fooled because we sort of like dress in similar ways. But if you look at even styles, styles go in, styles go out. Women are very intelligent about this. They have clothing which go out of style. They don't throw them away. They keep it because it's going to come back. And everything <laughs> comes back. Because we're dealing uh, with human beings here. And so what you got to do is recognize ways as you interact with people to find outcomes for both side gain. And you can do that because... I do not want the same thing as you. I act sometimes like I do, but I really don't. You know, I like, you know, uh, someone was telling me they like Italian films. I have a problem with any film nowadays, because I'm older, where you got to read the titles because yeah. go, the titles are in white and suddenly the scene goes from black to white and I haven't finished reading it. So I kind of go for English speaking movies. I wasn't that way 30 years ago. I read this stuff. I love this. You know? How do you, how do you like, uh, uh, negotiating? Has it changed dramatically since you first wrote, you can negotiate anything. Now, are we negotiating differently? Yeah. That old thing's a riot because like everything I find is sort of humorous in 1979. Playboy magazine said I was the world's best negotiator. Me? I was the world's best, and they wrote a big article about me in a Playboy issue of 1979. And uh, recently, I got this email from this big organization that said, congratulations to me, you have just been voted by who they didn't say the number six world's best negotiator. So I felt like writing back, which I didn't. You think that's a compliment? I was number <laughs> one. I dropped <laughs> off after all these years. But this whole thing, you know, is kind of funny. And uh, see, I believe that coming from the era that I came from, that is important for people to have power, to have a sense of mastery over their own lives. You know, there's a saying that everyone knows, uh, power tends to corrupt, but absolute power corrupts absolutely. Well, based on my experience, I believe that it was a lack of power that tended to corrupt. And people abused other people. And we had too much damn respect for authority. You know, somebody said something, well, I wouldn't question it. Well, I was raised to kind of question things. You know, and 
Did it rub off on your kids? Did the negotiating power, did that, has that rubbed off on your sons? Yeah, I think, I think my sons, especially the middle kid, they're and really Stephen? very- You mean Stephen? Steven. Yeah, he's very good negotiator. He's very low key, very bright, very sharp. We should tell, we should tell everybody what he does. You don't mind. No, I want to tell anybody what he does. <laughs> uh, he, uh, he has a legitimate job, and he's very successful. And all of my kids are successful. I have three children, uh, a daughter who's very successful, and a younger son who is a writer who actually makes a living, a good living as a writer, which I find is an aberration in today's world. But my kids are really uh, generous and kind and good because of their mother. I wasn't home that much. Remember, I was traveling. And she had a big uh, impact upon their lives. I mean that sincerely. And so she gets a lot of the credit. You know. Her name, by the way. I, have a I, 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 I met your wife. I think she's, she's wonderful. She was wonderful. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you, you have a great family. And your one son, I'm going to mention, uh, did the work with exonerating people who are wrongfully imprisoned. I think that's meritorious. I think we should mention that. Uh, I want to put that out there. Uh, it's wonderful work. You know, you, uh, you have uh, a lot to be proud about with those kids. That's just one item. There's a lot of things. But uh, I want to bring that up. Well, I... I the, you know, right now we're, we're talking about a guy that belongs in jail named Flynn. Is that his name? From, uh, but, but now he's going to get pardoned. And, you know, we put so much emphasis on rich and powerful people. He never even served any time. And yet, you know, your son is working feverishly for the common man who was wrongfully imprisoned. I mean, you know, you're right. You, you need to have power over yourself. But it also wouldn't hurt to have power over everybody else so that you can get done what you have to get done. But that well, doesn't always come to everybody. It's luck, I well, guess. I, I used to be a corporate executive. And I believe uh, in letting people know what the objective was. In fact, even negotiating that with them. And then letting them find a way to achieve the objective. I only cared about results, performance. And so when I was in corporations, uh, I, what I would do is hire people no one else would hire. First of all, I would hire women. Uh, what? Women? They're going to get pregnant and leave. So what? What do I care? Uh, I would... I would hire people that were like radicals. Uh, I would hire people that were minorities. I black, brown. Uh, my unit was like the United Nations, my office. And I would get ahead in this company because everyone produced like uh, X amount of widgets. And we produced five times what everyone produced. We would have audits because they believe we were all overpaying. And they found out we're actually paying less because people want to achieve. Like uh, I was regarded as crazy in corporations because I said to people, you can come in whatever you want. I didn't care. I was just looking at how they performed at the end of a month. Performance is good. They had a mustache in those days. You know, mustache. Beard. <laughs> Maybe everyone should have a beard. The beard may be a key to good performance. And th that was my attitude. Everyone was supposed to get to work at 8 o'clock. At the time I worked for this company, I uh, had a common gear that was like 8 years old. And it was run down. I never had it washed. I bought it secondhand. And instead of arriving at work 8 o'clock, I would arrive like 10. And... Uh, there was no parking space. By the way, I, I'll even tell you the company. It was Allstate Insurance Company in Northbrook, Illinois. There was no space. By the way, if you go up the tollway there, you see the office, big office. And uh, so I would get there at 10 o'clock. No space. 
And I drive around, oh, there was a space. It was, in fact, the best space in the parking lot. I don't want to walk 20 minutes to the office. I was never big on <laughs> exercise. So I would see this space. It was the CEO space that had his name on it. And it was the best space closest to the building. I pull in my common gear. I get, you know, memos from people and this and that. The CEO wasn't there. I knew he was on a field trip to California. So I park in his space. And they would write memos about me, and they try to get me fired. But they looked at my performance, and because I was a very high performer, they tolerated everything. The CEO met with me and said, "Herb, do me a favor. You know, let me know if you're going to park in my space." You know, <laughs> a buddy with him. Look, if you have a job where they can measure your performance. You could, be, you could be very secure. But if you have a job, a staff job in a company, you're in human resources. You are in uh, public relations. Someone looks at you and say, if we were to fire this guy tomorrow, how would we know he was gone? If the answer is we wouldn't, hey, that guy ought to be looking for another job. <laughs> Well, listen, we we're, 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 uh, have uh, run out of time here. Can you oh. believe it? Uh, but, you know, you've got plenty of time to, to uh, explain to everybody the name of your book. You've got a new one? Well, I have uh, two books they can readily buy. One is You Can Negotiate Anything, and the other is Negotiate This by Caring, but not that much. See, one this of the is- reasons we do lousy negotiating for ourselves is we care too much. We're emotionally involved. When you negotiate for someone else, you're detached. So what I tell people is don't fall in love with what you want. Fall in love with people, not material things. Fall in life. And so the other side gets the idea this guy could walk away. And that's maybe one of the top things to remember in negotiation. There's also all these audio tapes, which I made over the years. I think there's four tapes, uh, and they're put out by Amazon, yeah. Amazon Audio, and they're on various subjects. One I know is called Artful Negotiations. It's pretty good. And then my son, Rich, the writer, has a tape that they actually paid him for called Herbie. And it's about me, how crazy I am, you know, uh, and everything. How I, uh, if you challenge me that you can't do something, then it's certain that I'm going to try to do it. So, Are we supposed to be mad at China? Uh, I think mad is the wrong. First of all, we have to find out what the hell happened. And, uh, you know, President Trump thinks uh, he has personal relationships with people, and it's rather naive. Uh, com- countries operate based upon interests. They do what's best for them, and that's even uh, President Xi. So before we're angry at anybody, let's find out what the hell really happened. You know, we have a great intelligence operation. Listen to them, investigate this. Let Congress even get involved in investigating it. You know? And then you decide whether you should get mad or not and what, what kind of action you ought to be taking. Well, that's the way I've handled my marriage. That's why I'm living with my ex-wife. Thank you, yeah. Herb. Thank you, Toby. <laughs> You're great. You, You're great. One of my favorite people in the world, Herb Cohen. You can look him up, Google, uh, or else uh, Amazon. or You can even ask Larry King when you run into him. And well, uh, you'll hear I wonderful speak, things. I speak to Larry every other day, and uh, he's he now resides in Beverly Hills, you know, very classy. I'm back in Brooklyn. He's in Beverly Hills. <laughs> Thank you, Herb. Okay. Let, us, let a smile be your umbrella. Don't get a mouthful of rain. Bye-bye, right, Herb.